Welcome, everybody, to uh, what is week five of the book club, Failure to Disrupt, Why Technology Alone Can't Transform Education. Um, this week, we're going to be talking about learning games. Uh, thrilled that so many of you can join us. If you have a chance while you're in the chat, um, thanks for folks who are just starting. But if you can say who you are and where you're from and what your connection is to this material, um, that would be great. Um, and we've got three terrific folks with us today to talk about learning games. Um, Audrey, who you know from past sessions, Audrey Waters, um, who's an education technology uh, journalist and historian and critic. Um, and then two new folks joining us today, and I'll let them introduce themselves a bit, um, Scott Osterweil and Constance Steinkohler. Um, Scott, maybe we can ask you to start us off, if you can tell us, who you are, um, what kinds of things you work on, and sort of your ed tech story. Like what's one pivotal experience that you had um, in, uh, in encountering education technology, learning games, those kinds of things. Yeah, I'm Scott Osterweil. Um, my title right now is I'm a research scientist at MIT and uh, creative director of the MIT Education Arcade. Um, I'm really a game designer by, tr by um, and practice. I've been doing that for over 30 years. Um, and uh, I have so many, I, you know, I realized you asked that and, and I, I realized that nothing jumped out to me as more salient than anything else. Um, I guess one I would say that I learned early on is that the, the one product I worked on where we really had sort of a model for how the game would be implemented in the classroom. We thought through that question, not just what's a good game, but what's the environment in the classroom in which it's going to be used. We quickly learned that uh, there is no fidelity, that teachers, that no two teachers actually deploy the technology the way you had hoped they would deploy it. Um, I mean, some do, some do, some are great. Um, but it's, to me, it's, a, it's an important reality, which is just that, uh, Classrooms continue to be highly individualistic places, which I think is probably more good than bad, but that has a huge impact on the way educational technology gets deployed. So. And then we have Constance Steinkohler, who is extremely generous to join us. She has a bunch of family things that are going on, um, but we're super excited uh, that she made some time to be here with us. So thank you so much, Candice. Um, tell, can you tell us a little bit about who you are um, and what kinds of things you're working on these days? And then sort of your ed tech games, learning game story, what was it that catalyzed um, your interest in these topics? Sure, so uh, I started studying games in 2001, 2002. Um, not because I was a gamer, but because I was very interested at that time. The internet had just sort of passed about the 50% mark in American households. And um, I was really interested in what, what kind of like collective collaborative problem solving online could happen. I'm trained originally in um, discourse analysis methods for analyzing online social interaction. And so I came to games sort of through the back door because I was studying these sort of lab environment type spaces to look at cognition and reasoning in teams and groups of people. Um, and I got really frustrated because you know, you could show that, you know, different conditions led to different, you know, statistically significant effects. But when you open the transcripts and tried to look at what people were doing, it was very clear that there was very low engagement. Um, and I felt a lot like it was, you know, I always say it's like, it's like hiring the tabernacle choir to hum, right? It's hard to theorize and sort of understand what people are able to do in you know, in this case, internet technologies, when you're looking at a space where they don't want to be and they're not trying. So uh, Jim G, who was a major professor of mine, advised that I switch over to online games, and I downloaded my first one and never went back. Um, I was really captivated by the level of engagement, the level of cognitive difficulty in them, um, and really fascinated with this question of, you know, if kids and adults, but, you know, specifically kids for K through 12 that I'm interested in teenagers, um, if they're spending more time on games on average every day than homework, then what are they getting out of it? So I really did a lot of work around commercial games. And at that time, it was, you know, big news to find out that they weren't just simply uh, barren, that they weren't barren intellectual, intellectually. Um, and from there, moved into policy, et cetera. Right now, we're just finishing up a series of studies on an esports program. So it's a 
kind of an enriched esports model for kids. And I can talk about that if you want. That's kind of a, a little bit different take on the game scene. Um, but yeah, that's how I kind of got into uh, educational games and games and learning generally. So you weren't a gamer sort of pre-2000, 2001. You, just, you were, um, your, your hobbies and interests were elsewhere. And then you're trying to study collaboration. And someone said, hey, there's a lot of collaboration that's happening here. And that's how you intersected it? Yeah, I mean, you know, like a lot of women, I was, uh, I certainly did play at arcades. You know, I mean, I'm now, yeah, I grew up during our, the arcade games and Nintendo. So my family would not allow us a Nintendo. So I games, but, you know, um, a lot of us were excluded from an identity as being a gamer. And so I say, well, I didn't really game, but, you know, I certainly could crush anyone in the arcade games like Miss Pac-Man, Tron, Centipede, et cetera. And then Nintendo, you know, whenever I could get to a friend's house, we would play. But it wasn't an identity that I felt was mine or that I was actually allowed into. So it wasn't necessarily not doing games. But like compared to my husband, Kurt Squire, like he grew up on games. He never stopped, right? He went through the whole Civ series, all of that. And that, for me, that wasn't a thing. I stopped watching TV and really engaging in media when I was 17 and kind of looked down my nose at it until like I was in my 30s and realized that the media had evolved into some very different thing than what I had thought it was like, you know, back in the late 80s, early 90s. My, I have a very distinct memory of a sort of cultural watershed for me when I was teaching ninth grade in maybe 2004, and I was teaching ninth grade world history, and a young woman, you know, she would have been 14 years old or something like that, came up to me and was like, hey, Mr. Reich, do you know about this, like, Civilization game series? I think it'd be a great way to sort of connect with this. And she sort of said it, like, out loud in class with, like, no particular sense of shame or loss of dignity or something like that. And I was like, we've definitely, like... I barely would have admitted in my high school ninth grade class, you know, as sort of like a white male gamer that I did that. But if you could just wander into my classroom now as a young woman and sort of, you know, declare that you're really interested in turn-based strategy games, then something has changed um, with, within our culture. Um, so, Scott, um, I, uh, I wanted to turn to you to see um, if there are particular reactions to the chapter in the book about learning games that you had. Um, you know, I mean, I think the way that I tried to set up and frame the chapter in Failure to Disrupt is that in the first half of the book, we look at these three genres of learning at scale, instructor-guided things like massive open online courses, algorithm-guided things like intelligent tutors, peer learning networks like uh, Scratch and network learning communities, and kind of come to the conclusion that a neat thing about the field of learning games is that you can both find all three of those things and you can find some interesting examples of hybridity, sort of more hybridity than you typically find um, in other parts of education technology. Um, what, how, how did that argument ring for you? What did you find sort of misplaced or compelling? Or, or can, you, can you start us off just with some, some of your own take on the chapter? Yeah, no, I was struck. I hadn't thought about that particular um, sort, sorting of things, but although I found it convincing. Um, I, be, I guess I had tended to look at games in terms of um, whether or not uh, they were giving, I mean, I, I, I'll admit I sort of lumped games into two categories, um, of which, you know, your, your first example, Math Blaster, was category A, which is just sort of anything that was, that viewed learning as largely Skinnerian, so you do stuff and you're going to learn it just by doing it. Um, Great. Let, let's take a minute. Yeah. To, let's take a minute to break that down. Um, so by, by Skinnerian, you mean, um, well, let's turn to Audrey for this one yeah. because Audrey has been working on a book on, on teaching machines um, for which uh, BF Skinner plays a big role. So Audrey, g g give us the rundown on what Scott means by Skinnerian. Right. Well, this is behaviorism, right? And in particular, I think it's this idea that machines can be used and computers um, but machines, in this case, but machines can be used to sort of condition students, right? And so you're presented with a series of questions or circumstances in the case of a game. And if you get it right, you get a reward. And that positive, that positive behavioral reinforcement um, is how one learns according to behaviorism, right? Learning, um, learning is a behavior and you want to reward that behavior in order to sort of 
enhance it. And so, yes, exactly. You sit and someone down in front of them. He does this with or, pigeons. He gives like yeah. pigeon snacks, or maybe they, I, I don't know if he punished the pigeons at any point. Um, he was not into punishing the pigeons. He just wanted to reward the pigeons. Just That's reward, right. yes. We can, we can pin many crimes on Skinner, but animal cruelty may not be one of them. Um, <laughs> all right, so, Sc so Scott argues that a game like Math Blaster, which if they're young, I'm sure everybody who's our age in the audience immediately knows what Math Blaster is, but younger folks may not remember that it's like this little space invader like game um, where there's uh, um, you know sort of a little alien spaceship on the bottom that's shooting things at the top but you, the only way you can make the cannon fire is if you answer math problems correctly um, and if you answer math problems correctly you get to keep playing um, but the math problem is the obstacle um, that's preventing you from having fun the math problem is if you're a good if you're a good pigeon and you do your arithmetic right then we'll let you have the fun of, of shooting at aliens rather than the notion that this is a fun, interesting problem. Why don't you sit down and enjoy? So, I, so to me, I sort of thought either, either games treat the, the core um, intellectual content of the game, and it doesn't matter whether we're talking NBA Jam or, you know, um, or Call of Duty or one of my games. They either treat the intellectual content of the game as interesting and worthwhile, or they treat it as something you've got to get through to have fun. Good. Um, so for you, that's like the two primary categories of learning games. Right. You know, they're either, you know, behaviorist, like learning as obstacle to be able to play a game, or you actually find the game and the playfulness in the learning materials that's in right. there. And I also, I'm, I'm with people like Ralph Koster who would argue that all games are learning games. All games are about mastering a difficult challenge, learning how to master a difficult challenge. Um, and they almost all require some amount of creativity or ingenuity if they're an interesting game. If it's too easy to master, then it's a boring game. And so, so um, which probably gets at, you asked the sort of, um, if I saw something sort of, I had different take from you. I guess it's that, um, I mean, you, you talk a lot, and I think rightly so, about issues of transfer, near and far transfer. And so your, your sort of look at learning games is largely in the context of how do they align with schooling, mm -hmm. uh, right? Um, and, I, and I guess most people who make learning games are guilty of that too, of thinking about how does this game align with schooling? Um, whereas to me, the interesting thing is actually the process that people go through developing mastery and, um, and the way that shifts their identity about themselves. Um, and that... Uh, that uh, I'm sort of cutting to my to my punchline here, but that I think that the real work we should be doing around any game is sort of helping people recognize the learning they've just done, um, and maybe maybe be able even to vote to to verbalize it a little bit. Like it'd be great if if a kid said if, if a kid could say, oh, you know, I solved that by by controlling for variables, because kids are controlling for variables all the time when they're solving a game, but they don't know it and they've never learned to to see it that way, and then they never learn to and then you're right, no transfer is going to occur. There's no way that a kid who, who does that is going to recognize that that's scientific practice and become a scientist. But if you can help a kid say, gee, you were just doing what scientists do when you, you know, when you won Call of Duty, maybe that kid would be interested in pursuing science or history or, you know, or just having, and leave aside that for a moment, just having an enriched and fulfilling life because they suddenly recognize the power of intellectual activity more broadly. That's great. Yeah, so so just for people who who uh, read less of the chapter or who I didn't describe it very clearly for people, um, you know, one of the core questions that comes up in learning games is this issue of transfer, and transfer is a topic which has interested educational psychologists for at least a century. Um, and transfer sort of works like this, as far as people can tell. Um, when you learn something in one domain, you tend to be pretty good at doing it in that domain, and then when you take what you learn and apply it to something different. It can be very, very frustrating to teachers, to educational psychologists about how, what a short distance that transfer can go. Um, one of my favorite stories around this is uh, someone who is coaching schools in math told me a story about a middle school teacher who spent a whole year teaching her kids about Venn diagrams because they hadn't done very well in Venn diagrams the year before. So they did Venn diagrams all year long, got to the state test and all of this, you, you all remember Venn diagrams, they have two little overlapping circles. They go and look at the end of year state test, um, which the kids get wrong. And the Venn diagram has two overlapping squares. Um, and the teacher's theory becomes that the students didn't recognize that, that a Venn diagram problem couldn't just be a circle, but could 
could also be a square. Um, and so the following year, she said, oh, okay, we're going to still do a zillion Venn diagrams problems, but now we're going to do them with circles and squares and pizzas and hexagons and, and trains and anything else that we can think of um, to make this uh, overlapping transfer work. Um, so the idea, you know, the huge question in games is if you spend a whole bunch of time playing Minecraft, do you learn, you clearly learn how to do all kinds of interesting things in Minecraft. To what extent do you learn um, how to do things outside of Minecraft? To what extent can you recognize those skills? And I, you know, and I would say, Scott, what you've just sort of proposed is that maybe one thing that games don't do as much is highlight for you what it is that you're learning and doing in that process. You know, like, Hey, Minecrafter, like, you know, you're doing a kind of like transmedia analysis. Like you're learning about this activity on Reddit and on wikis and by watching YouTube videos. You could also do that with math. You could also do that with hairstyling and makeup. Um, there's lots of ways that you can, that you can do that. But I, but I do think this question of transfer is sort of central. Um, uh, Constance, I know you've thought about this a lot because you've tried to highlight the various ways in which the kinds of things that people do in games um, have all kinds of resonance in potentially in other parts of their lives. Um, how in your work have you thought about people transferring their learning from games to other parts of their life um, or, 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 making, or making games and the environment around games better at doing those kinds of things? Yeah, I mean, I think to build on what Scott's talking about, you know, this notion that, um, I mean, games are transformative in more ways than simply filling a bucket of content, knowledge, skills, and some dispositions, right? Um, and I do, you know, just looking at the comments, um, I do think it's important to note that if we're going to talk about games and learning, then we have to deal with, like, learning stuff that may not be intended or necessarily what we want students to learn. I think all of that is sort of in play. But I think it's really important, too, you know, to really push back a little bit or at least be cognizant of this model where um, kids authentically interesting and, like, interested, invested, affinity-driven work is supposed to pay off in classrooms, where classrooms are actually supposed to be paying off in their interest-driven, authentic work. So I just want to push back a little bit because, I mean, the topic of transfer, you know, when you can't find transfer in studies um, after, you know, what, 25 years in cognitive science field I'm trained in, and yet people are learning and applying knowledge to different domains all the time, you have to wonder whether or not our formal definition and our operationalization of that formal definition are really appropriate versus people are just that dumb. I think probably we're not conceptualizing it in very rich ways. I know that I haven't always in my own work. So, you know, just thinking about how do we come up with new ideas? And there are some scholars out there who have. But on the topic of transfer, you know, I, I, I think there's, I think there's something a little bit strange about saying that, um, that a game is a design space and what you learn in it, you know, may not always transfer outside. And yet a classroom is also a design space and what you learn in it may not always transfer outside. I think there are a lot of different ways to think about that. And one way to think about it, you know, just going back to some really early work that I was doing because I was coming at it from this traditional transfer model, right? And I was looking at literacy and scientific reasoning. There's some studies I did there in particular where not only were they not transferring it, but they were really resistant to the idea that they should, could, or would, right? Like even calling it science was really pushed back on by the kids I was studying. They were like, no, 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 no. Um, and I think that if you look, I mean, for me, if you look through some of the interview data, again and again, what you see is really akin to sort of what Scott's talking about around, um, I guess I would say sort of transformations and an understanding of what one is capable of or who one happens to be in this world. So it came up particularly, I was, I'm thinking of a couple interviews um, around leadership because I was looking at multiplayer games and multiplayer games, massively multiplayer games, you know, have really um, fairly robust communities inside them. I would say even more so than uh, other multiplayer genres like MOBAs, right? Um, MOBAs now that's debatable. I probably just like people. completely threw a bomb in the comment section. Apologies, but shorthand, I would say that they do, and that's probably debatable. But I'm um, in those spaces. You know, people have to think about themselves as a social creature, and they're, you know, one of the amazing things about games, you know, 
you're both here and there at the same time. And so sort of what Scott was talking about where there's this moment of reflection to think about like, what am I doing? Or a moment of pause to think about how am I gonna respond to that, right? How am I gonna deal with someone who just said, I can't do my job when I know I can? And you've got this moment of pause just so in terms of social interaction that you don't get when you're face to face. When you're face to face, you know, you've got an entire body face and all your gestures that are that are communicating information, whether you like it or not, and you have a lot less time to respond. So in terms of social identity, just as an example of a topic, there's this really important capacity of being both here in the real world and online socially as a, you know, genuinely interacting with people at the same time. And one thing that came up in interviews was really around this idea of um, a transformation in who you see yourself to be, and who you see your like, or what you see your capabilities of being. Right now, this was early work I did, and all of the interviews there were all rosy and wonderful, you know, and about leadership and diversity. You know, I'm not sure it can. I'm not sure it always has to be so rosy. And now working on the side of more trying to understand. What are the causes of disruptive player behavior and harassment? And how do you stop it? What you find is that people absolutely deny that they are both there and here at the same time and deny reflective work on that. So, you know, I think that the, the sword cuts both directions. But I do think it's a compelling um, alternative to the standard configuration of learning and transfer that we often come at when we come at it from only a cognitive point of view. If that makes sense. Yeah, that yeah, you're you know, Go ahead, Scott. Sorry, go ahead, Jeff. No, you no go ahead. Scott, please, please. I was going to say what you're what you're saying, Constance. Remind me is we never ask of school what we ask of the other the things that we talk about outside of school. We never say what kind of transfer happens from school to life. Yeah. <laughs> right. And even Jeff, more importantly, like, and you know, <laughs> reading is a good example in yeah. that. So you there are reading interventions. Jim does some really wonderful writing about this in his early work. Jim's there are reading interventions that literally you can show that you might increase decoding skill, but you end up creating non-readers, right? Now, I want kids to be able to decode because you have to be able to decode to think about content, but I also want them to identify themselves as readers. Right. I want them to think of themselves as voracious readers of whatever it is that they love. So they're they're connected but they're not you know they're they're not one does not assume the other there's a there's a sort of an assumption that whatever we've inherited as our model of schooling must be right so you know i've since i started early in this space i'm used to people asking um sort of are games good for you good for you or are they good for learning no one ever says is jane austen or, Sha or is shakespeare good for you Mm -hmm. or good for learning. I mean, it's just a given because they've always been part yeah. of the, and I love both of them, by the way, but but they've always been part of the curriculum. So we just assume that everyone's got to read Jane Austen and Shakespeare and we never interrogate why, um, you know, and yet, uh, and, and that's not, and that's not giving new technology a pass. I'm not saying therefore, ergo, it must be fine. But, um, but it just, it does sort of show the degree to which we don't examine what we think school should be. Um, uh, in your work with schools implementing these games, like how, what are the places that you found where games have been effective in getting teachers to rethink teaching or schools to rethink schools? You know, one of, just questions coming up along the lines of, you know, perhaps we're disadvantaging the game intervention by not focusing more on changing the nature of the learning environment. Yeah. Um, to what extent have you seen games be a useful lever for getting communities of educators to think differently or or to behave or you know to organize themselves differently um, around teaching and learning I, and it, you know it's it goes back to my first comment about implementation it very much depends on how they're used but when when i've seen teachers who actually take the trouble to understand what their kids are doing in the games they also frequently discover that kids who they thought were unmotivated or uninterested or not understanding actually had capabilities and talents that they revealed in the game. Now, these are probably teachers who wanted to find that, you know, I mean, I'm not sure the degree to which that can work for, for a teacher who's so fixed in their dispositions that nothing's gonna change it. 
But I think most, te- I mean, to, to their credit, I think most teachers want their kids to do well. So given an opportunity to actually see the kinds of work their kids are doing in, in an interesting game does seem to have an impact on the teacher's perception. And sometimes, and, and sometimes even on their thoughts about their own teaching. Um, occasionally you get comments that sort of suggest that they're think, they think more broadly about sort of project-based interest-driven learning based on what they see in games. Unfortunately- Triggered by seeing kids who didn't, who, who haven't connected with the curriculum in other ways suddenly, yeah. you know, see, the, see their, their, their cognitive wheels turning um, and maybe some of these other sort of, you know, motivational yeah. engagement kinds of wheels turning. Right. Now, I don't think that I don't think that games are games are the only thing, or or I won't even argue the best thing. They're just one of many kinds of more authentic ex- ex- activities that I think would would do that. So, so Constance, I'm curious to get your thoughts on this, especially as it relates to your recent work around esports, because I feel like one of the ways that e- so esports for people who don't know about them is for the mo- and tell you can disagree if I'm getting this wrong, but it's like taking commercially available games like League of Legends or Overwatch or other kinds of things like that, um, creating teams in schools that play against other schools, but because the sort of infrastructure doesn't exist um for these sports in the same way as it does for soccer or or for field hockey or something like that um the students also end up like organizing tournaments and advertising you know and creating media around the games and things like that that there's this like whole other infrastructure that ends up existing around the games um which strikes me as you know it like you know, there's usually my understanding is that there's usually an adult mentor involved in some kind of role. And so it's, you know, it seems to me like it's not just putting a game into an existing space in schools, but kind of an opportunity to create a whole new space in schools in which you might be able to attend to a bunch of these contextual factors that can make learning more rich um, or, you know, or, or feel more connected for students. I don't know what, what are, what are you finding um, in looking at esports that connects to these ideas? Yeah, no, I think you got it well. Um, you know, first, it's it's worth pointing out that now, you know, esports has been big in Asia, specifically like Korea, for 15 years, 10 years, 15 years now. Um, and really, I never really imagined that it would become a global phenomenon. But right now, I mean, just for the record, you know, there were more spectators of the League of Legends World Championship no, that's globally, but certainly like far outdid the number at like before pandemic NBA finals, which, you know, my family is a big basketball family. So it's all to say that, you know, there's a lot of talk right now and a lot of energy around esports for a variety of reasons. Um, in the open market outside of education, it's because people see huge uh, profit making opportunities. Um, in the education space, what we're seeing, it's really interesting. You know, I, I, I moved from Madison, Wisconsin out to Irvine, California. And the first thing that happened when I got to campus was, um, you know, they gave me a tour of our esports arena. We have, and you know, we have this like winning team in League of Legends and I was totally blown away. I mean, I, I was just like, I don't even understand where to put this in the world of phenomena. Um, and, but we have a varsity and JV team. We play across multiple titles. And now it used to be there was like maybe 20 or 30 schools. Now it's like 170 universities with uh, college scholarships. So, you know, now the discussions are evolved and they're around things like how does Title IX apply? Title IX applies to everything, um, <laughs> including esports, um, and issues around who's going to be the governing body. So, this is already out, it, it's out the gate. Universities, just to make it super clear, universities uh, now have esports teams that are collegiate level that compete and have athletic scholarships attached. So all that is said. Also, quickly in high schools and middle schools too, right? I mean, yes, exactly, exactly. So now what you're seeing is that it's it's now down into high schools and middle schools. Even middle has been this last 18 months. I was like, whoa, Nelly, I did not expect that. But really, sixth grade and up. Um, because you have to be online to play. And I think it's possible that the pandemic has maybe escalated some of that, but it was already in play before that. And what a stupid word to use. <laughs> it was already sort of in the process of sort of amplifying. So now all of these high school teams, and there's a whole bunch of um, for-profit, some of which 
I won't name, but are not at all. I mean, they're, um, uh, how do I put this? Private efforts that are pay to play that really have, you know, sort of do this hand waving to um, being good for kids. I mean, I'm, I'm in the space of what, it's my personal commitment. If you're working with kids, it ought to do amazing stuff for them. It doesn't mean it all has to be educational, but it needs to be designed for kids and thought of as for kids. And not all of it is. So it's sort of the wild, wild west right now. And, um, you know, we started, we got involved because there was this effort to make the first ever scholastic esports. And what that means is that it's an enriched esports model. So they had, you know, they asked me to come in and just first look at their program the first year and understand where would you connect it to content in classes? Where would you connect it to big ideas? And then how do you build activities that would actually do that connecting? So, for example, how do you use, um, uh, like, how, you know, how do you get kids engaged in, like, data science? Because it turns out that understanding your summative data and some of your gameplay data, knowing how to parse that can help you play better and help you compete better. And that really has evolved into... Um, us looking at things like tilt and emotional well-being and emotional self-regulation, not just content areas. But tilt, it's a very in the phenomenon of getting super frustrated while playing and having your having the quality of your gameplay go down significantly because you're frustrated and uh, those kinds of things. Yeah. So you're you're saying making some connections. There may be academic connections, but and there also may be social emotional learning connections. Like here's here's a place where people have a lot of feelings. Um, let's help them understand their feelings and how to manage their feelings in ways that are that are productive. I mean, that sounds like right yeah. down the line of what middle schools ought to be doing with part of their time. Yeah, uh, I mean, and I have a bigger agenda that isn't necessarily the program's agenda, but my agenda is that I see people acting online in ways to each other that are totally inhumane. And game culture is no exception. In fact, it was one of the first places that we saw it really go crazy, like really go hyper inhumane. So to me, this is just another place where we might be able to shift the needle a bit toward helping players stop acting in ways that are terrible and hateful to each other. And so we start digging into that some. But, you know, one of the interesting parts of this program, or one of the, one of the reasons esports, I think, is a provocative space. The downside, the, the con of using it educationally is that, you know, um, Esports is never, you know, esports is played across different titles. Kids will play the titles they love, and that's that. It's very hard to diversify because, you know, like I would love to see parity in terms of how many women are involved. We're not even at like, we're at like 30, 35%, not even that close. But, you know, you, you can't go in saying you're going to tell teenage girls that they're going to like League of Legends. Life doesn't work that way, right? So that's the downside. The downside is that it's hard to figure out how to diversify it in the ways I, I want to, but sort of slow going. The, the positive side is this. I've been studying kids in games for a long time. And oftentimes when you try to tackle issues of how to treat other people online, how to deal with conflict, how to, um, you know, how to manage your screen time and also stay physically fit. It's very hard to create interventions around games that kids just don't spit right back out and they just don't take because they're often kind of um, layers added on top. Like they're, they're not authentic to the space, right? It always, in my efforts, and I'm sure people have done better than me, but in my efforts, it always seems to be sort of colonizing and like the kids will ignore me and it sort of comes off as mom is wagging a finger saying, you need to get up on that screen and go stretch, right? Well, esports is interesting because there's this notion of coaches and for the kids that we're studying, and this program is now over 700 schools and has a four-year high school curriculum attached to it. That's how popular it's gotten. Um, what's so interesting is that these coaches, you know, Esports is a sport, and so coaches are playing and debriefing cheek to jowl with kids. And so there's this normal place in which an adult or a mentor tells them how to regulate their play, how to regulate their feelings, and you can start talking about things like, listen, we can you know, just sidestep the issue of what you ought to. I can show you in your data that when you behave 
this way, your entire team falls apart and your performance goes down. So even I can tell you why you ought to be a better person online, but setting all that aside, forget all my values. If you want to be a good player, you if you want to you know be a pro, you have to be able to hold it together and not not go toxic on people. And I think that makes this really exciting kind of intervention that other spaces around games don't have. Well, and I think the the way it fits into some of the arguments that I've tried to make in Failure to Disrupt is that when we sort of slot tech, when we when we slot things into schools just on their own, they they get absorbed or they they don't operate in the ways that we want them to, and they don't want operate nearly as well as when we think about sort of broader kinds of changes. Because I'm definitely yeah. imagining like you know the library media specialist trying to teach the like be nice to other people online lesson. Um, and, you know, and I, I mean, those actually work pretty well in second grade because I'm getting all those worksheets home right now. Um, but yeah, by the time you're in sixth or seventh grade or something like that, it's just, you know, like sliding yeah. that along. But as you point out, sort of bringing the game in with coaches, with teams, with time to be together, with structure, you know, it creates opportunities for these kinds of things to exist um, that, uh, that, that wouldn't exist before. Um, Kevin asked a question, um, is esports disruptive to schools? Um, have we, have we found that sort of like when you bring game culture into schools that the worst parts of game culture are unleashed in places? Um, or, uh, um, is there, is there, is there any, is there anything that you found around that? You know, I haven't found that, but then, you know, we're really focusing on this one program and evaluating it. So what we find is that, you know, to be in the league, you have a code of conduct. There are coaches that have been vetted for security to work with kids. Um, Connected Camps runs that, like a coach program where they vet, the, they vet these, you know, basically college kids um, to work with kids and then train them to be good mentors. So there are structures in place and also a code of conduct and there's consequences, right? They have to have a, it's just like any other club or sport. You have to have a 2-0, you have to behave yourself, you'll get kicked off the team. So what we found is that it's sort of this nice sweet spot. I should also say that, um, you know, for, for the kids that are attracted to esports, depending on, you know, they vary by the title. But you know, for that demographic, um, it's very interesting that many of them have never had the experience of being coached before. And I think that that alone is a really powerful thing um, to actually have like someone who, you know, regardless of whatever your hobby or your, your, your sport is, like, you know, imagine that you have someone who's an excellent gamer, they're a college kid majoring in whatever, computer science or whatever, um, and so they're really good at, at what you do and what you want to aspire to do, and they're also setting you a good example. Um, and many of the kids, you know, when we ask them, like, what do you get out of this? Why do you come back? They'll talk about how important the coaches are. They'll talk about how they feel like school is actually a place for them. And it comes down to these little things, like some schools will do things like um, let, let the players have letterman's jackets or announce their victories at the beginning of, of school the way you would any other sports team. And, you know, as adults, I think it's easy to see that as just sort of dressing. But for the kids we interview, it's the difference between them feeling like they belong there and they don't. It's really important to them. I should also say the other weird thing about the qualitative data, we do a variety of forms of evaluation, quant and qual, but the quantitative data is that for many of them too, they are, it's the first time someone has ever said to them that behaving in ugly ways online is hurtful. Mm. And I can't believe it because we have high school kids, right? The So far, it's mostly we've been had high school kids. I'm not really studying middle school. And I'm just like, are you, are you serious? Like no one has ever said to you, guess what? Don't, you know, don't call girls those names like for real. But it's just, they just, I guess they're just surprised. And they're, and, and that even just being told that by a coach seems to make them go, oh, really? That's a thing? Like. I can't just say I'm joking and it's all okay. Yeah, yeah, lots of opportunities there for um, for for bringing bringing in new and desperately needed messages. Um, 
one set of questions came up that I want to make sure that we got to. It was actually from the forums was just about sort of the learning games industry, which Scott, I know is something that you've spent a lot of time thinking about having worked, you know, for, for things that with commercial releases for university based projects and things like that. And, you know, the observation basically being that creating really good learning games is enormously expensive and they tend to attend to specific parts of the curriculum or specific skills and goals. You know, someone said a ballpark, uh, it was Kristen DeServo in her, her comment online said, you know, some places spend as much to build a learning game as they do, to, which might, you know, be associated with a week or two of school as it does to build a whole year's worth of curriculum in other materials. So I'm just curious, what, what are your thoughts on um, the broader industry of learning games? You know, with, with, and I think the connection to the theme of the books is saying, you know, we can't just think about the development of learning technologies exclusively in their learning features or exclusively their technology features. It's like the whole sort of system that exists around them. Um, so what, what's, what's your sense of where we are right now, you know, given that, you know, one obstacle used to be that there weren't computers in schools, you know, yeah. by the end of the pandemic, you know, a substantial portion of the 57 million kids in the U.S. are going to have a computer in their hands to learn with. Is that going to make learning games more viable or are there still sort of other obstacles to be addressed? No, I, I mean, I, I'm not particularly optimistic about sort of a market driven good learning games. I would say, and I, and it's gone through a bunch of different cycles. Um, the main, I mean, the issue for games is the same issue for publishing in general, which is to say that the easiest way to sell in the schools is to set, is to, is to have these giant workforces um, that, that only the big publishers can afford. And so what you see with learning games is people come up with, interesting or whether good or bad they come with some reasonably smallish idea and discover it's almost impossible to make a business out of selling that one idea into a school um i would say what what exists as a learning games industry is are people making apps to sell parents and i think it's always been that way the goal has always been to sell parents something for their kids um improvement and unfortunately um it, and it, it happens to coincide with a 30 year period where school has become more and more focused on uh, uh, sort of, uh, it's been more and more conditioned by a status anxiety. As the middle class fought, fears it's falling farther and further behind, more and more of parents' interest in their kids' education is about what's gonna give them the leg up in this highly competitive world, not to do anything good or worthwhile, but just to survive or to get into, the college that I think I need them to get into or whatever it is. And so, and it started early, you know, it started in the nineties when I was first getting started is suddenly there was a shift toward games that were sort of implicitly suggesting that it was gonna help your kid get into Harvard, you know? Um, and that's really been, I would say that's been the industry ever since. It's sort of gone through different fads in terms of uh, this product or that product, but the, but the, the marketplace has been basically addressing parental anxiety um, about their kids learning. It wasn't that way when I started. I mean, there was a brief, um, there was a brief period in the early nineties and it was really because at that point people had computers were still people who kind of thought computers were kind of cool to mess around in. And they wanted, and they, and they wanted their kids to have that same experience of messing around with interesting stuff. And so when you have a consumer base that's interested in messing around, there's a wider range of learning experiences that you can create for people. Whereas if you have a consumer base that's really focused on sort of status anxiety and making extracurricular yeah. happies be things that are, you know, career advancing for 11 yeah. year olds, then there's just sort of fewer and fewer things that, that folks can do. Right, that's right. I mean, I think most of the interesting stuff in the learning game space, and I used to not feel this way, but I think now, maybe it's partly because I switched to working in a university, but I do think it's, it, they're not good enough, but the interesting ideas are being generated, you know, by academics, even if they're not, they don't necessarily have the art to, to follow through with them, or, you know, to make good games always, um, or the productive know, the production know-how. But, um, but I think that's the last place where people are still trying to do you know, and then, no, and then you get the odd, you always get the odd inspired person who somehow manages to you know, work in their basement or in their garage and make something cool, and occasionally one will take off um, for short periods of time. So it's not that it strictly belongs to the, the universities at all, um, but the larger marketplace isn't going to reward those 
you know, except occasionally by fluke. Um, and I, you know, and I think that's a theme that cuts through a bunch of the book, which is if you're where, if you're looking for places that have the sort of freedom and the runway and the funding to do interesting things in the public interest and in learner interests, um, it's often easier to create those conditions in universities um, than in uh, than in the commercial sector. Although being a person in the university, I suppose everyone should take that with a grain of salt. Um, you know, so what, you know, I think, I mean, to me, an interesting thing about learning games is that there, there's all this richness in all kinds of spaces, but still um, the most, uh, you know, the, the widest applications of games in schools are things like Kahoot, which sort of turn quizzes into um, gaming spaces, or, um, I, you know, I think there's a ton of applications of sort of gamified K5 math happening right now um, with Dreambox and ST Math and those kinds of things. Um, Audrey, maybe you could help us by putting some, you know, putting some of these games in kind of a longer context. So Audrey has been working on this book, Teaching Machines, which is coming out in February from MIT Press, which you should all read for sure when it comes out. I don't know if pre-orders are available yet, but uh, um, it's really great. Uh, Audrey, help help us see how some of these things that 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 some, some of the tools that people are using right now as games in classrooms really have ideas and roots that go back to the earliest teaching machines in the United States? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, you know, as I was, as I was saying earlier, I think that, you know, we, I think in education and perhaps in psychology, as in educational psychology, we like to sort of say that behaviorism is behind us, that no one's a behaviorist anymore. We're all, you know, we all do cognitive science now or neuroscience even, but I would argue that behaviorism and, Ha is really still thrives in ed tech. Um, and in fact, I would say that it's because ed tech's roots really are in behaviorism, in this idea that we can shape students' behavior um, through, through machines, um, that we can reward them to get them to, to do the, to exhibit the behaviors, to exhibit the, the things that we, we want them to. And I think that something like cahoots uh, the, or Kahoot with the, the, the quiz, the, the fun quiz app <laughs> is, you know, you can really see the way in which um, how students are sort of seen as, you know, this sort of Skinner's pigeons, sort of, you know, performing the way in which, um, performing in a sort of experiment to, in which I guess it's supposed to be fun, but at the end of the day, it's really just a, a quiz that's been, you know, that's kind of got this I wouldn't even call it like the the chocolate coated broccoli, chocolate covered broccoli that you talk about in the chapter. It's not even <laughs> broccoli. It's like and it's not even chocolate either. <laughs> it's, like, it's like insect protein covered <laughs> with like you know sort of. It's just like a shiny so, pellet, a pigeon pellet, right? I, yeah. will, I will say I uh, you know my students at MIT. I teach class about education technology. They bring technologies into schools. Um, and and I have them use technology in various ways. And so one group um, did a Kahoot presentation on some topic. Um, and one of the things that the students noted um, was they had a strong reaction to the Kahoot music being played, which they hadn't heard since high school. But it was basically this kind of conditioned response, like, oh, the Kahoot music, now it's time to do a fun thing. Uh, so, I, so I think that, uh, um, uh, you know, that that's a, that's a great example. You know, Anne makes the point, Kahoot is routinely on the things of lists they want to do. They seek them out. They report it's more engaging to review material. I mean, I think my MIT students would be the, it would, would be great examples of that as well. Um, and I think the tension for educators, you know, thinking about these technologies would be something like, um, you know, there, there must, there, there, there's plenty of evidence that there are circumstances where playing behaviorist gamified games is seen as a desirable alternative to whatever you were normally doing in class. And on measures of student learning, probably either does nothing or provides some modest benefit to learning. I mean, I think the sort of like meta-analysis of games in schools sort of leads to the conclusion that like gamified things are about as good or maybe even a little better than non-gamified things, depending what you're comparing them to. Um, so it's, you know, I don't, I don't know, Audrey, what, what are, what are, what are your, what are your thoughts of that sort of notion? Like, Hey, you know, the kids like it. 
I mean, I think that the, it's, you know, I think the, again, a, the, a person of the, the math blaster, you know, generation, I suppose, is that if you have a choice between doing math worksheets on paper or, or getting some time in the back of the classroom on the one, <laughs> the one computer that was in the back of the classroom, that did seem a lot more exciting. But I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that they're actually substantively that different. Um, uh, it's just that you know one had some one had some bells and whistles. It was just a different a different presentation, um, and it's certainly not the kind of thing. Again, that sort of makes you want to do more math necessarily. It's just a matter of have I again have I done the things I was supposed to do to get this reward? Well, great. Well, you know, Kevin, who joins us from Brain Pop, um, shares some links to some things that uh, games and other kinds of resources that they have there. And I certainly know that, especially during last spring, um, Brain Pop was a was a refuge for my two kids uh, finding things to do there. So um, it's it's been I don't know there <laughs> there are a whole bunch of things which over the point of my career I've had various occasions to be critical of. Um, and then you know you've got two elementary school kids in a pandemic, and all of a sudden like they're looking pretty good, right? Right now so uh um yeah actually some of brain pops videos about uh um about some really controversial topics i forget whether they whether they were looking at uh um civil rights or slavery or some other things like that 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 might that were both good and my students got totally into well, we've come now towards uh, the end of our hour together. Um, and I hope that folks are starting to see some of the themes that we've been consistently talking about coming together, um, particularly these ideas of both looking at technologies in their broader context. How does a thing like a learning game fit within a whole ecosystem? If you wanted the learning game to really be powerful and work well, how would you have to change that whole ecosystem? And then recognizing you know, how much the past is still present within our learning technologies, you know, and, and in, in my examinations of pedagogy, um, there, you know, I sort of emphasized ideas around direct instruction um, and uh, um, sort of progressive approaches to teaching as important continuities to look for. Um, but earlier, Constance brought up, you know, a long history of approaches to transfer, which is worth investigating. Audrey talked about the, the ongoing presence of behaviorism. So I think there's lots of ways that we can look to the past to, to better understand the present. And then the second half of the book club, what we'll spend our time doing um, from these weeks forward is looking at four as yet intractable dilemmas, um, puzzles and challenges and, and, uh, and limiting factors on making powerful, effective, broadly distributed learning technologies, um, the curse of the familiar, the trap of routine assessment, the ed tech Matthew effect, and the toxic power of data and assessment. Um, so I want to thank Constance and Scott and Audrey, all three of you, for joining us for a really terrific conversation. Um, thanks so much for, for being here and, and sharing your thoughts with our book group. Thanks. It was fun. It was a real privilege. It felt like a privilege to be able to, to talk to your group. So. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Good. All right, um, thanks everyone. Uh, to those of you who have ongoing follow-up questions, feel free to post them in the, uh, in the forums for the, for the book club. Um, and we'll be back next week. Um, now I'll have to, one thing about my book is that I, I actually can't ever remember the order um, in which I wrote the chapters. I think the next one is the, the Curse of the Familiar. Um, and so I think, uh, um, that means that we're going to have Dan Meyer coming and joining us from Desmos um, to talk about uh, some of the challenges we talked about today. How do you do really pedagogically interesting things um, and, and create creative learning opportunities and also have them really take root in schools and grow there? So thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, and we will see uh, many of you next week again. <laughs>